those of you who don't know me, my name's Steve. Um, it's nice to be visiting. It's lovely to um, be back here. It's 32 years ago this week that Vicky and I stood just about here and said those fatal, <laughs> I mean, special words and, uh, and got married. So it's lovely to, uh, to be back and it's uh, nice to be back even without my Baptist World Aid hat on and just uh, to talk about something that um, really excites me and that is the topic of prayer. Um, however, I do want to say that while I'm happy to speak about prayer, there's probably two things that you need to know. Um, just sort of disclaimers at the start. One is that I'm not very good at it, and the second is that I'm not really into it. Um, but other than that, we can talk about prayer today. And it's a challenge for me, not being good at it, not really being into it, because the Bible is full of these instructions that we should pray, and we should pray continually. I, uh, I like to see them as like suggestions or guidelines um, that uh, can be uh, taken in and we can think about them, but maybe we can just ignore them again because it's um, safer that way. Because I don't know about you, I grew up in a nice, safe Baptist church and prayer meetings were awful. Anyone ever been to an awful prayer meeting? Hands up, put your hands up if you've been to a bad prayer meeting. You're allowed to, it's okay. Nathan and Aaron are facing this way, they're not looking. I, I, I didn't mean here, of course, I mean in other places, you know. Um, but I just remember they were, they were terrible. I remember it started in Sunday school where we'd pray together, we'd all sit in a circle and uh, we'd all hold hands and pray. And uh, you know, you'd go around and say, if you didn't want to pray, you'd sort of squeeze the hand of the person next to you that you know, you know, you pass it on, and they pray. And you know, they're, they're always, there are always some people who love praying, right? You know, those people you go to an hour prayer meeting and they pray for 57 minutes of it <laughs> without breathing. You know the people. You know the ones. Stop nudging the people next to you. Um, <laughs> There are people who have lists of prayers and they come and they, they want to pray through their list and it's not done until they've got through that, that list. The, I remember growing up in church, um, we had, the church secretary would give the notices from his own special little pulpit off to the side and he'd give the notices and then he'd pray and we'd sit in the back row as youth group kids and uh, our challenge was to count how many times he said the word just in his prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you just that we can just be here today, Lord, and just come and win. And we'd all tally them up at the end. That was the challenge of the morning. It kept us interested in prayer for just a second or two. <laughs> Did I say just? Oh, now I'm in trouble. Are you going to count them for the rest of the thing? Um, but Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, Always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Paul is always on about praying. Every single letter he writes is on about praying. Every introduction to every letter he writes has prayer in it. Um, really quickly, Romans 1.9, God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring you and your needs to prayer in God. 1 Corinthians 1.4, I always thank God for you. Philippians 1.3 and 4, every time I think of you, I give thanks. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. Colossians 1.3, we always pray for you. Like it's, it's there over and over and over and over and over and over again. Prayer is important and it's commanded and, and we, we know, I don't know about you, we know we should pray more. Have you ever felt like you should pray more? But it's just tricky. It's hard to do. We seem to struggle with it so much. So let's talk about my two main issues with prayer. One is that I'm not very good at it. I would find it was just so hard to, uh, to pray like other people prayed. Yeah, you know that. You go to a prayer meeting, you're like, oh, well, I can't pray like that. Or I can't pray like that person. Or this, you know, there, there are some people who like, when they pray, their language is amazing and you, they, you feel like they're just caught up in something. You know, I could never pray the way they prayed. And there are other people who think, I don't want to pray the way they pray. <laughs> and when I, um, 
when I was becoming a pastor, when I was doing my, my ministry training and I was starting to work in churches, I was overwhelmed with this sense of guilt that we should do it more as a church. We need to pray more as a church, but no one ever comes to prayer meetings and those who do come are not the people we'd want to come anyway. And like it was just this sense of guilt and shame and this heaviness so we should pray more but no one really does and we made it's probably easier if we just don't and then I remember um, hearing this sermon from an American pastor called Jim Simbley you may have heard of Jim he's written a few books um, uh, he leads a church or he led a church called the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York um, and he said he took over this church that was small uh, and had all sorts of problems. One of the people that was taking up the offering was stealing the offering. They had all, all sorts of stuff going on in this church. And he just decided we're going to pray. And he said, we're actually going to mark, we're going to measure our success as a church, not by how many bums on seats there are on Sunday morning, but by how many people turn up to the prayer meeting. In fact, and that's what they did. They set their whole metric of success around how many people came to pray. Would you do that? What would that look like? I remember when I, um, I it's really interesting to, to see the, the faces in the room today is um, really quite scary because um, it's like there's convergent stuff going on all the time right now in my life and it's, it's sad because God's trying to get my attention about all sorts of things. There's a bunch of people from Wyala here and I pastored in Wyala for 13 years and um, uh, I remember turning up at Wyala and uh, the church had decided before I got there, Ian can tell, I don't know when it was, but before I got there, the, um, the church had decided that to not have an evening service, but to do use that space for other things. And it had become one of the things they did on Sunday nights was have a prayer meeting. And I thought, oh, I'm the new pastor. I should turn up and go to this thing. And I turn up and there's like three people. And um, these three people would get together every week and pray and their prayer they prayed for all the things that were going on in the town and the church but they had this common prayer that they would pray every week lord make us a praying church lord we want to see more people at the prayer meeting we want we want to be a church that's undergirded by prayer and not just by us few people who get together on a sunday night and in that journey in Wales, i discovered uh, I should have, I should have, I know I studied this when I studied at theological college, but you never pay any attention to church history at theological college until it's too late. I got to my last year, uh, five years at theological college, I got to my last year and thought, I really wish I could go back and do my first year subjects again, because like now they sort of make a lot more sense. But I uh, discovered the story of uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf, von Zinzendorf and the Moravians. So you all know that story really well, right? <laughs> Okay, let me really quickly tell it to you. Zinzendorf was, was a German uh, account. He was aristocracy. He was a landowner. He had lots of land. He was very wealthy. And um, when he was young, he made this commitment to follow Jesus and, and to serve him, but then went off to university and didn't really know what that looked like. And while he was away doing other things, uh, his land that he owned was in the eastern part of Germany, near the, uh, what would now be the uh, Czechoslovakian border. And he discovered that a bunch of refugees had come across the border and were camping on his land. And it was the appropriate thing to do if you're rich and wealthy and had lots of land to allow them to stay. It was like seen as the right thing to do. So he allowed them to stay, this bunch of religious refugees who'd come and they'd landed uh, on his property and they they stayed there and they were an absolute rabble they were a mess they had infighting and all sorts of stuff going on and Zinzendorf said look I'm happy for you to stay but we have to get some sort of order to this and so what he did he did two things one is he created a, a, a an annual list of bible verses that he wanted everyone to study on the same day every year so he got this big brass bowl and he cut up all these little bible verses and he put them in and then they picked them out and said oh january 1st it's this first january they did that every year right they still do it actually they still do it to this day this was in the 1700s and they still do it it's called the moravian daily text you can get it online you can uh, buy the book it changes every year and they do it um, and so every family, every household will study the same Bible verse every day. And the second thing is they started a prayer meeting. 
And there was just one of these prayer meetings that it just had been praying for a while and suddenly it was like the room was filled with the presence of God and that prayer meeting continued night and day non-stop depending on which church historian you read for either 100, 120 or 130 years without stopping. And that birthed the modern mission movement. Have you heard of William Carey? William Carey was influenced by the Moravians. They, they met, the Moravians met this young Anglican pastor who wasn't actually a Christian but was an Anglican pastor um, in, the, in the bowels of a boat in the middle of a storm where he was totally freaking out and he got converted there because he was amazed by the way the Moravians were praying in the midst of this storm when they all thought they were going to die. A guy, he, you might have heard of him, he's called John Wesley. And John Wesley and Zinzendorf had a falling out eventually and Wesley went back to England rather than staying in Germany and he started the, the Methodist movement based on what the Moravians were doing and based on the prayer stuff that they were doing. So the modern missions, modern evangelism, the modern church was birthed out of this 130-year non-stop prayer meeting. And I thought to myself, what if we did that? So we started to try it. We, we came across this crazy bunch of people called um, the 24-7 International Prayer Movement and we started hanging out with them a bit and we started trying this non-stop day and night prayer thing in Wyala that went for, we just started doing some 24-hour things. The first one was awful, it was terrible. It was run by the youth group. I don't know if any of you guys were there at the time. I'd better be careful. But, but um, it was in this room and in, uh, in one corner there was a guy with a guitar singing worship songs and leading this little group of singers. In the opposite corner of the room there was another guy with a guitar leading a completely different group of people with completely different worship songs. And in the middle there was a guy who really, really, really wanted to play the guitar and bought one the day before and brought that to the, to the prayer meeting. And he was sitting on a table with his brand new $2,500 mate and guitar picking one string. Just ding, ding. And it was just chaos. We, uh, we learned some lessons out of that and we started to shape it a bit differently. And by the end of our time in Wyala, we were regularly doing uh, round-the-clock prayer stuff, including two weeks a year where all the churches in Wyala would come together and pray together for a week at a time, uh, in the middle of the year, uh, beginning of the year, end of the year. And God started to do some really crazy things. We started to have encounters with angels in our prayer rooms. We started to have people walk into the prayer room and be healed without no one, know, no one even knowing they were sick. They'd walk in, were healed, and walk out again. We had all sorts of crazy stuff start to happen. So I have come to believe that while I'm not very good at prayer, if I pray with other people, something happens. There's an accountability for me. And all of Paul's letters, all those things we talked about, Paul's writing not to individuals but to the church. Pray continually, not just by yourself but together. So there's something that happens when we pray together. And the second thing is, of course, that I'm not really into prayer. It doesn't really excite me. But I am into Jesus. And it turns out that prayer is pretty important in that relationship. As I want to know Jesus more, then I have to pray more. I have to spend time with him. I have to talk to him. It's where I encounter him. And that looks different at different times in different seasons. And sometimes that looks like with worship music. And sometimes that looks like the thing that I'm not really good at is, you know, sitting in a dark room with a candle and just staring at it for a while. Sometimes that I was in Nepal just a couple of weeks ago. And the way they pray corporately is... Um, uh, everyone stands around in a circle and holds hands. And, um, you know, we didn't sing Bind Us Together, Lord, and anyway, we anyway. Uh, and then everyone just starts praying at the top of their voice at the same time. And the person who's leading that then prays louder than all of them over the top of everyone else while everyone else. Like, that's how they do it. And it, it was fun, but chaotic at the same time. But here's what I believe. I believe that right now we are at a significant moment in our national history where it just seems like God is stirring something up again in his church. I don't have time to tell you all the stories of that, but there is a lot of stuff going on right now around this country where God is at work in his church. 
It's a significant moment internationally right now. There's just stuff going on around the world that is freaking us out. And the response we have is to pray. Time is right to develop a culture of prayer that undergirds and drives everything the church does. Now is the time for this. It's an invitation from God right now. What will we do with it? Will we find some time and light a candle and stare at it in the dark? Or will we get together and pray? I even hear that there's little bubblings of things going on in this church of people starting to want to get together and pray. What's God stirring up in you right now? How can you do it more? What would it look like to add prayer to your day? I know we're all busy, and I know we've all got lots of things going on. So in the context of your day, what would it look like? I'll tell you some of the things that I do. Some really simple things. Some of you already use the Lectio 365 app that's produced by 24-7 Prayer, and and I encourage you to do that morning and night. That's great. Um, I have my watch set for noon, and at midday every day I pray the Lord's Prayer. So they go, oh, we do that too. Like, and let me tell you, it's really um, it's, um, the most inconvenient thing in my day. Because all the bad things happen just before at noon. I remember when I, when I, was, um, when I was pastoring in Wyala. Pastors, you guys don't understand this, but there are people in our congregations who are really, really wanting to be helpful. And one of the ways they do that is uh, late Sunday night, they send us emails to just give us some constructive feedback about what happened Sunday in church. And I remember opening one of these emails one day, sitting at my desk, and um, it was really, really, really helpful about all the things that had gone wrong the day before. And uh, I was just about, I was replying to the email, right? And and it's just such a... (laughs) And my watch dings and it's noon... And I'm thinking, any second now I'm going to have to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. (laughs) Big swallow, a moment or two with God, backspace button a little bit, and pray. It's really interesting how God interrupts my day just with a simple thing happening at noon. It's really people all over the world in part of the 24-7 prayer movement do that. And it's really great when you're in a, when you're in a 24-7 prayer gathering somewhere on the other side of the world and it hits noon and you hear these alarms go off right across the room and everyone just stops and prays together. What would that look like? Just one thing, inserting two minutes of prayer in the middle of your day. What would it look like to have... Your, your life shaped by a rhythm of prayer. We, our, if we think back to how life used to be a few hundred years ago when we all were in little villages, so our ancestors were in little villages somewhere in England or somewhere in Europe or somewhere that um, there were no, um, we didn't carry around watches or clocks or any of those things. The, the rhythms of the day were where the sun comes up and the sun goes down and then the bells on the church would ring at different times to pray. And that's sort of what ordered and structured our day and then watches came along and and then bosses and then electricity came along and bosses worked out that if you had a watch then they could make you turn up at work at a certain time every day and because of the electricity it didn't matter if it was dark or not and and suddenly we started living a different rhythm by around this clock and this watch and, and life got faster and faster and faster and faster and now it feels like going back to that thing where we just get up when the sun comes up and go to bed when the sun goes down and and listen for the church bells as to we know when to pray, doesn't seem like it really fits with who we are anymore. And yet there are ways to do it. The Lectio 365 app, praying the daily office, starting with prayer in the morning and finishing with prayer at night. I often fall asleep listening to the, um, uh, the, the um, examine at the end of the day. Pete and, Heather's voices just, uh, Pete and Hannah's voices just make me go, oh. I, I did apologise to Pete once that um, I fall asleep listening to his voice. 
Not when he preaches, just when he does that thing. Um, or find some rhythms that work. Um, uh, there's this great uh, thing that people do, uh, walking labyrinths. Has anyone seen a labyrinth? Do you know what a labyrinth is? Walk, this idea of you, as you walk into the middle of the labyrinth, you sort of let go of all this stuff, and as you walk back out, you back, re-engage back with God. Well, you can do that when you're dropping the kids off at school. You can, anything that you do that has a two-beat rhythm, you can do the same thing to it. As we drive to the shops... We pray and let go of all this stuff, and as we come back home, we re-engage again. We can use all these different things as different ways to fit prayer into how we might do. I, I've got a friend who um, was a missionary in India, and she had four young children all at school. She was homeschooling them, and her and her husband were missionaries at a, um, at a school. So the kids went to school part of the time. She homeschooled them part of the time, and she was just busy. She said, how am I ever going to find time to have some regular rhythm of prayer in my day? She said, well, one of the things I do being here in India all the time is I drink lots of water. So every time I take a glass of water and drink it, I'm going to remind myself that Jesus is the water of life. And so she built this prayer rhythm into her life just to stop and just to remember where the source of her life comes from. What might that look like for you? What, what might it look like individually to find ways to incorporate prayer into your day? To find other people that want to do the same thing. And they might not do exactly the same, but you might find there's ways that your rhythms can sort of intersect and, and maybe, maybe you want to end up praying together or hosting some time in a prayer room or doing some of those sort of things. It's really important because God's up to something right now in our nation. God is really up to something. In June, just this year, in uh, Eternity News, there was an article about uh, prayer and, what, and revival and what God might be doing and this quote, whenever you study a great move of God, you'll find that there was a group of people who were praying beforehand. There's lots of things that are different about moves of God all over the world throughout history, but there's one thing that's always the same. There were people who suddenly got a desire to pray. And when they got that desire to pray, it might just be two people. There were two businessmen that prayed in the late 1800s in Melbourne around the time there was a guy called D.L. Moody. Have you heard of him? In America. And these businessmen heard about what Moody was up to and they started to pray. And they decided they really wanted to try and bring Moody to Australia. Moody died, couldn't come here, but his, uh, his next successor, a guy called R.A. Torrey, came to Australia in about 1902. And when he came to Melbourne in 1902, the population of Melbourne was about 1.2 million people. And there were 250,000 people at those meetings. A quarter of the population of Melbourne. There were 70,000 people meeting in small groups to pray leading up to that event. In Melbourne. Ever been to Melbourne? That's good for coffee and not much else. <laughs> Any Victorians here? <sighs> Collingwood, uh, whatever. Anyway. What happens when God starts to stir up just a couple of people to pray? And we read about revivals that happen all over the world. We read about things that happen in Wales and Scotland and Europe and America. But there have been many, many moves of God in our own nation. 1979, Elko Island. Revival amongst Aboriginal people that still has its legacy up there today. I met one of those elders just about 10 years ago. And he was just telling me the stories about it. And I said, you've got to pray for me because our country needs this. I, I actually believe that the next revival that's going to hit our nation will happen amongst Aboriginal people. God seems to do stuff amongst people who are on the margins. If you want to get close to God, get close to people who are on the margins. Get close to people in prison. Get close to refugees. God's doing something in our nation. And he's inviting us. Will we be people who pray it in? You know, we started praying in Wyala in 2001 that God would change us and make us a church that prayed. And in 
took till 2008 before that we saw any fruit of that. And by 2011, things were off the charts. But what a privilege to be in it from the ground level. There's something going on in our nation today. There's something going on in our city today. And I believe God is inviting us to pray. To find a way to do it, personally and corporately. Will you find a way just to add a few minutes of prayer to your day? There is a warning thing that comes with it, though. If you add a few minutes of prayer and encounter Jesus, you're going to want to pray more. Your life might get a little bit out of control over the next months and years as we surrender more and more of that to him. But will you pray? Like I said, I'm not good at prayer. I'm not really into prayer, but I really am into Jesus. And I think he wants to do something in our city and our nation right at this moment. It's amazing that he invites us to participate with him in that. I think he's stirring us up. So here's what I want to do. I don't do this very often anymore, but if you feel like God is starting to stir you about what he wants to do in our city, what he wants to do in our nation, and you feel like God's calling you to a deeper level of engagement with him through prayer, would you stand? I just want to pray for you today. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you birth something new in this place today? A heart for you a heart for your kingdom, a desire in your people to pray. Well, we sang about it right at the start, burn like a fire, burn like a fire in us. Not for our sake, God, but for yours. Not for, not for the benefit of the church, but for the benefit of your kingdom. Fill us again, Lord. Fill us again with a passion for you and a desire to seek after you. That your kingdom would come. And that your will would be done right here in this place. And in our city. And in our nation just like it is in heaven.